When I was 20 years old competing in my first contest, I would say I spent the first few years just following the traditional old school methods and constantly became more frustrated because it just didn't work. So I started a promoting contest as a drug-free competitor uh, in my mid-20s, and that gave me access to a lot of competitors, a lot of judges. And I was almost like an investigative reporter figuring out, like, what are these people doing? How do they look like this? How do they look like that? What was their perception of their peaking experience? And I just kept running into these brick walls, Austin, where nobody felt like they ever looked their best on contest day. And so I, I just happened to be moving through my own education journey. So through allied health, pre-med, became physical therapy, and and on throughout even into you know advanced degrees in nutrition and so forth. I was learning a lot about what we're going to cover today, exactly what happens in the body with water, with ions, sodium, potassium, et cetera, because those seem to be the most manipulated variables that people always talked about. But I just knew intuitively, since the human body and muscle tissue is 65 to 75% water, and that's what made you full when you're in the gym and you see and feel the quote pump and you see vascularity, that is water. Why can't we maintain that on the stage? And I, I had actually won my pro card as a WNBF pro before I ever figured this out. And, and I remember that was kind of the last straw. The morning I woke up of the, the world championships to um, you know, win my pro card, I was flat. I just looked awful. You know, the skin, even on my forearms, was just spongy and uh, it was just, I was so dehydrated because of course you were cutting water. You were also eliminating sodium, all those old school foolish methods we're going to kind of dispel today. But I gradually figured this out. And as I started writing for a lot of the top bodybuilding magazines and started coaching competitors way back in the, the mid to late nineties, uh, I don't want to say I experimented on my clients, but I will say that I started engaging in better practices, more physiologically, scientifically valid concepts. And the the results were there. You know, at this point, over 500 pro cards, won over 50 world championships, 150 pro titles. Um, I know you know this stuff because you're kind of that second generation that came along when we had created that playing field of at least some scientific evidential material. And now there are those two camps. You know, that is certainly a well-populated group in our industry. A lot of people even doing research. Uh, yet we still contend with people who just do it wrong. They do it dangerously, which actually kills people every year. And I, I'm frankly a little surprised we're still fighting this fight. But, you know, again, this is going to be our attempt to really create some solid content to, to create better paths for competitors. So with, with that a little bit as a background to my story, I would be interested to hear your competitive relationship personally with how you have ever experimented with, with water, sodium, potassium, things like that. Did you ever, did you just kind of stumble into doing it the right way or did you suffer through some trial and error? Uh, I, I suffered quite a bit. Um, I'm from South Dakota. There wasn't a lot of active bodybuilders. So I reached out to some of the local guys that retired and, you know, they gave me things and things that they did when they were younger and whatnot, and then reading bodybuilding magazines and all that stuff. So my first three shows of my career, I just prepped myself. I was trying to find information as much as I could. You know, it wasn't as fast back then. Like you had bodybuilding forums and YouTube wasn't really made for putting out high quality content at that time. It was more like cat videos and weird commercials and things like that. So, you know, it was just a little harder. So I tried to formulate and do my own thing. And, um, you know, I did smaller shows. So, I mean, I placed well, but that's probably because they were just smaller shows. You know, I, I really wanted to like take a step further and, and finally start doing bigger shows where there was lots of people. And, you know, I hired a, a coach online and, and fortunately it was the cut the water and do all these crazy tricks. And there was no explanation as to why we're doing it. It's just, this is what everybody does. This is what the pros and the Olympia people do. We're just going to, you know, cut your water and watch your sodium. And you're only going to eat like beef and 
oatmeal or something weird and you know or it's just going to be just asparagus and fish and we're going to come in like this and you're going to do all these things and it's just crazy so once information seemed to become more available like people are paying attention to this stuff a lot more then i was starting to consume that more i was getting different certifications and i was trying to just learn and then that's where i really dove into it i'm like i'm going to get this certification this are all about nutrition to try to soak up what i could and use that as my 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 kind of using myself as my own kind of case study if you will and then I was starting to coach people and had people that I would try to work through these things. And I had that conversation. I'm, I'm a new physique coach. So we're going to work through these things together. Um, and then I kind of just got irritated of fighting the fight too, of people doing crazy methods that were hurting people, uh, killing people. So, um, you know, when I was reading the magazines that you were writing in, um, and seeing other people in the physique sport world that were starting to get their PhDs or their masters. And they're really pushing education with nutrition and the science of bodybuilding and just doing nutrition the right way. It just inspired me to go back to school. So I'm like, screw this. I'm, I'm not, I want to get the information for myself. I don't want to be like, well, I heard it from this person. Well, I heard, I don't know. I want to just go straight to the source. So I went back to school, became a registered dietitian. And I'm very thankful. It was very hard. It was very, very difficult um, because I did that as a non-traditional student. So talk about bodybuilding. I'm prepping myself. I'm prepping clients. I'm trying to learn this material through school. I'm doing all of these things. And uh, and it was stressful, but it was worth it because now I feel like I can pay that forward. Having my bad experiences when I was younger, having all these weird questions. Now I feel like I have had the opportunity to share my experiences, share the science, do this with you in hopes that it just gives people consistent, real scientific education and information to use for their journey. So um, long answer to your to your question, but that that's kind of my journey as well and, and how I had to fumble through some preps to kind of get to where I'm at now. You've become a very successful multi-title winning pro, by the way. So <laughs> Uh, we talked a couple of days ago about our actual premise for this. And I said, you know, we may have 20, 40, 50 of these, and then we're just done because we want to create a, a bit of a canon or library for all the topics that people in physique sport need. Uh, I, I don't want this to become a podcast where, you know, we just show up and shoot the shit and, you know, what do you want to talk about today? Plenty of that goes on and that could be fun, but being very, very education minded uh, it made sense to do the first one on on hydration because that has to be the biggest dichotomy in the sport. And my my first question to you is: Have you seen? I don't know if it's a TikTok challenge or I, I saw it on YouTube Shorts, but the gummy bear water and salt experiment. I'm, I don't think I've seen this experiment okay. yet. Uh, well, I'll make sure we put this in in the um, the demo here. Or, or show it as a demo. So you put in a, a gummy bear into a little pan of water, just what gummy bear that you would eat. And you add some salt, a certain amount of table salt, you put it in the refrigerator for 24 hours, you take it back out and the gummy bear is about a 100 times its size, it goes from this little gummy bear you would eat, <laughs> this monster thing that looks like the size of a toy. It's a, it's a great picture of what we're going to talk about today, yes. because to move water across cell membranes, you need ion transport, you need passive or active transport, you need uh, gradient perfusion, you, you have uh, charges on each side of that membrane. The entire goal of the human body when it comes to the, the, the most foundational essence of life has to be hydration, oxygen, you know, just those base elements of life. And it's somewhat funny and ironic to start equating this to how you look in your underwear on a stage at 3% body fat, but that does have everything to do with how you will look in those circumstances. And so that's just a great, almost little, you call it a homeschool experiment on the osmolarity of, of water across tissue. And so, you know, what happened to those gummy bears? You added salt, which is a positively charged ion that helped transport the water into the tissue, being the sugar structure of that gummy bear. It's exactly what we're going to be doing when we talk about this in, in this sense of, of peaking. Now, the, the the final thing I want to do maybe as a little bit of a disclaimer is let everybody know, you know, you as an RD, me with a, you know, couple of doctorates and master's degrees in health education, allied health stuff, nutrition, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, I'm not a nephrologist. I don't deal with this kind of thing on a daily basis, but I, I certainly, you know, we both have enough physiological knowledge in understanding how to read these uh, studies and so forth to apply it appropriately. So as you guys, as listeners or viewers go through any of our content, anytime we say something wrong, which could just be a simple transposition of the wrong word, or maybe we really do have a concept that's not in the right chronology, or it's just not as relevant, you know, please let us know. I'd love to see those conversations. And if we can do anything to correct something on the record, please, please, you know, give us the chance to do that. But let's go into just, just you know, this this whole thing about water, right? So I, I was reading some research as it relates, Austin, to athletes, you know, endurance athletes, performance athletes. And, and there are protocols for getting a certain amount of fluid into your body over a certain amount of time. Like if you're an NBA basketball player or an Olympic gymnast or a marathon runner, you know, about four hours in advance, you want to start thinking about hydration. I mean, hopefully you're still, you're pretty hydrated across the board, but for muscle cells to work, for muscle tissue to contract, for nerve conductivity, for action potentials, you know, across those synapses to even create strong muscular contraction, you have to have hydration. You have to have these ions we're talking about, specifically sodium and potassium, because that's what creates the sodium potassium pump across this membrane. But other ones are there, you know, things like calcium and so forth. Um, if you're not thinking about that in advance, and I think this applies very much to bodybuilding because we think in terms of peak week, you know, what are you doing seven days out, six days out, one day out? What are you doing four hours before? What was your first meal, second meal, third meal of the day? And, and you know, I, I think just to get some basics out of the way. The RDA for sodium, for example, is, is around 23, 24 milligrams a day. Uh, they say we need about 500 milligrams just to sustain life. Uh, oddly, all the way up to 9, 10, 11, 12 grams of sodium per day is where we see some national averages for people who have things like hypertension and so forth. Uh, but yet those of us who are athletes and train a lot, sweat a lot, drink a lot of water, sometimes we errantly think we need sodium to be super, super low, you know, like only 1500 milligrams a day. We're not having any canned or processed foods, that sort of thing. You actually have to get under about 3000 milligrams a day, three grams a day to even see that that's a level where your body doesn't really care that much any longer. Like you, you don't even reduce hypertension or risk of stroke and so forth if you go much below 3,000 milligrams a day. So I want to bring that up because we need sodium. We need a certain amount of sodium. And some people may think it's less, some people may think it's more, but it's, it's an egregious error to think that, okay, we're two days away from a contest, three days, one day, so we're going to go down to zero. You know, when we need it most to not only contract muscle tissue, but to hold water in the muscle tissue, you know, it you have to consider it an essential, essential element in our diet. So especially with your RD background, I would just love to hear how you try to explain the relationship between sodium, potassium, and water to clients on a regular basis, because I even see a lot of competitors now, including sodium as part of their pre-workout. Like, hey, I'm getting ready to go do deadlifts or squats. I make sure I get a certain amount of sodium as well as my pre-workout caffeine or something like that. So, so with all of these variables just kind of swirling around us right now, before we really dive into it, what would you say is an introduction to people just to make sure that they're paying attention to this material? Well, I appreciate that you brought the, the background and the importance of our water and our electrolytes, like the specific sodium and potassium. And you had mentioned the sodium potassium pump. One thing I talk to my clients and, and other people about if they've been on an unfortunate program that pulled sodium and pulled water and done something like no water, but a cheat meal and all that type of stuff, which we'll, we'll dive into here in a little bit. But um, so well, I'm going to start with water. Okay. So we, we need water. We all know that that seems to be a reoccurring thing, but then water and sodium are really good friends. They're like best friends, wherever sodium goes, water follows. That's important to what I tell my clients, because when we want to try to fill up and fill out, we need water. We need glucose, right? From the carbohydrates that we eat. So what happens is, you know, we have something called a, uh, a sodium glucose co-transporter. Okay. Um, 
we cannot really get the glucose into our cells because we need to have a co-transporter. They get onto this protein carrier. They go within the cell. Once sodium and glucose have entered the cell, sodium kind of detaches and, and does its thing and gets ready to be executed out of the cell because sodium is our main extracellular fluid. It's one of the main ions for the extracellular fluid. So once that gets kicked back out, glucose is now in, right? That's great. Glucose is now starting to get in. Well, what did I just say a little bit ago? Sodium water, are our best friends. Now we're also getting sodium, glucose, water into the cell. Sodium leaves out. Glucose, which we know gets stored as glycogen within the muscle and the liver. When we store glycogen, we also store certain amounts of water. So it's like one gram of glycogen for like three, four parts of water. So just let's just look at that. That's kind of what I, you know, in in a shorter version, of course, because we're on a podcast here, we're talking. But in a shorter version, I'm like, let's look at just the physiology. These are things that we know physiologically that that happens in our body. So do we think from a bodybuilding standpoint to try to make our muscles pop and look big and look lean? Physiologic, do we think that that makes sense to take any of those variables out of the equation one day to two days before the show? No, it does not make sense at all. We are not helping ourselves. I understand the concept when we want to pull things back like sodium because we want to look at a drier look. But really when it comes to that, I think with a lot of people I've talked to, you know, the consensus and everything is, is I think getting there. You need to be leaner. It's, it, you're, you know, it's not necessarily that you're holding water per se. If you're trying to look leaner, you need to be leaner. Once you do that, you put your body in a nice position to allow a little bit more glucose to get into the cells. Again, we want to drink water. We're starting to hydrate that muscle and we're allowing to fill that out more. And things like potassium, I kind of wish people would pay attention to potassium a little bit more because, and you know, I don't want to jump too far ahead when we'll, we'll eventually, I think, talk about diuretic use. But, you know, if we don't get enough potassium in, that can cause problems. That can cause health problems for us. That can cause performance problems as far as, uh, you know, uh, muscle contraction, possible cardiac issues, things like that. So, I like to go through some of the, 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 the background of the physiology. These are things that we know with sodium, water, and glucose and what that does for us. We know hydration is important and we know we got to get water, especially for flexing on stage. And we might be in a big class. You could be on stage for a while. You're sweating. You know, we lose water and sodium through that sweat. Like we got to make sure we're prepared to be on stage for a long time. Like we just have to set ourselves up. That's just the performance side. You know, the look side, that muscle fullness and roundness and being lean and all that stuff, that's the internal thing that we also need to focus on. So I try to go through all of that um, with my clients. You know, some I think probably think I'm crazy and like, why are you explaining all this to me? But I want them to know that this is why we're doing what we're doing. And if you decide to go to another coach and they don't do this, ask the question and see if you get a similar answer, because that's putting your health at risk. Well, I, th I think that's probably the bottom that we want to hit for the purpose of this podcast. When you start talking about glucose, sodium co-transporters and, you know, that sort of thing, um, because you could, you know, I, I mean, there are probably a dozen or so glucose transporters, but mm -hmm. the, the glucose sodium one for our purposes is the most important because we're talking about intramuscular fullness for how we look, even nerve conductivity in the, the important part of, um, you know, sodium for that to be able to contract properly, because I've seen people on stage who are dehydrated and lacking sodium, just completely cramp up, lock up. Uh, they can't even contract muscle groups. You know, they're just the, the nervous system, central nervous system is just offline, basically in survival mode. So let's, let's back up again, because as, as we're framing this for our audience, I want you to see again, that we're worried about how you look on stage. And luckily, you look your best on stage when you are truly at your healthiest, when you're not dehydrated and you're not overtly manipulating, um, you know, ions or, or elements like this. So what I think the, where the misinformation came from, when you look at the fact that we're talking about hydration systemically, how hydration works in your body, and then down to the cellular level, and we want to talk about muscle cells. Uh, whoever came up with this old school methodology, I, I kind of get why they did it because when, when you see a filminess 
under your skin, over your muscle tissue. We call that spillover. And, you know, sometimes it it is water at some point. If your body fat levels are lean enough and you may go way overboard on sodium or you over carb and you spill over, there is a fluidy buildup. And so you think, okay, that's extra water. I don't want to mess with that on contest day. So I'll just make sure I dehydrate. And then if, if you look just superficially without any knowledge at the sodium potassium pump, the fact that intracellularly you you have a little bit more of a negative charge, and so we we the body just for survival likes to have a little bit more potassium inside the cell, a little more sodium concentration outside. So you think, great, we want water quote in the cell, so we need more potassium, more potassium, more potassium. What we don't realize is those things work together for the sodium potassium channel to work. The sodium potassium pump, it's three parts sodium to two parts. Uh, potassium. And like you said, you need sodium to get the glucose in that then makes the water follow it in. And then the sodium returns back to the outside to, to keep that, that membrane charge and, and polarity the way it should be. So a, you really can't manipulate this like you think. I mean, you have to have all the components there and you have to make sure you are manipulating the right things because serum sodium levels in those intra and extracellular concentrations are just going to immediately go back to the way they were because of homeostasis, because of survival and life processes. Knowing that is how you control it. Knowing that you're going to cycle through certain things so you can then control the timing of that cycle is the goal. So one more thing that I think is important for people to realize on that big systemic level, because your body is so worried about the, the concentration levels of sodium for nerve conduction, because your brain, your heart have to work, you know, your vagus nerve controlling your sinoatrial node of your heart, your left ventricle, all that stuff. Uh, you know, that's, that's the, that's home base for your body. Your body controls through aldosterone and your kidneys, how much urine you're excreting or not to keep those concentrations where they need to be. Your body isn't necessarily saying, I want you under or over hydrated. If you consume a ton of sodium, for example, let's say I go out to a crazy meal, you know, out in a restaurant and I have 5,000 milligrams of sodium all in one meal, my body is going to, because of all that sodium, going to tell my kidneys to stop excreting water because we want all the water in the body to stay there because sodium levels are too high and it needs to keep that concentration, that solute uh, to solvent concentration where it wants it to be. It'll even, that's why it even increases your thirst when you consume salt because your body wants more fluid to, to you know, keep that dilution quotient correct. So all of that to say, if you're a bodybuilder and you care about how you look on stage, meaning you want the most fullness, i.e., water in the muscle cell. So you have to have water in your body. You cannot dehydrate. Then you control how much your body is excreting or losing by the sodium consumption that you're using. So me as a coach, Austin, you know, I'm looking at unlimited water, just normal levels. I'm not hyper hydrating, but you know, through peak week, all the way through the night before the contest, I don't, if you're used to drinking a gallon of water, great, two gallons, great. Don't get crazy, but cause you don't want to dilute, you know, those, those ions too much. But then when it comes to contest day, how much water are we going to consume? Should we limit? Should we not? I tend to not limit, but I don't overdo it until we get closer to the, to the stage because I want water to be there as a tool to use. It, it's fine. I'm not triggering aldosterone to, to do anything untoward, uh, but at the same time, I want to be able to increase water right up to the stage to increase fullness because that's when I may increase sodium and a little glucose. And if I do water at the same time and the body doesn't have a, a flooding of it early, then I can make sure I'm controlling exactly what we're talking about, that, that the water is going to be following those solutes into the muscle cell right when I need it because you truly have somewhere from almost a near instant reaction to maybe a couple of hours. And then your kidneys are starting to respond. And so you start to, to see maybe the excretion of that. That's why it's important sometimes to even consider your urination at a contest on a contest day. If you're drinking, if, you, if you've had about 60 ounces of water and you feel like you've urinated out twice that much, 
you may have a problem. You, you may be getting flat because now you don't have enough sodium to hold that water in. And so those are all things. Again, these are these are the probably the three biggest variables, glucose, sodium, and water to really control how full you're going to be. And then of course, by the end of our chat today, we're going to talk about, you know, maintaining that tightness, you know, how do you get the fullness plus the tightness? Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll even go through some, some numbers, you know, how much sodium is appropriate and so forth. So all, all that said, Austin, where, where do you go from, from here? I'd like to go back a little bit. Um, I like how you were you brought up the point of of hydration right so like with your water where you're at um i think people that's where they make that first mistake they either increase it too much which now also can play a role like so if you drink more water than what sodium you're taking in you're now going to have a shift of you may not be looking the way you are you might be taking in too much now that's a problem but if we match the water consumption with the sodium and the glucose our body isn't really seeing these dramatic effects unless if it's something that's just rampant and out of control. I myself as a coach, I like to see where their hydration status has been. Like what, have, how much water have you been drinking? How many fluids? Cause that's a different thing, right? When we're talking about like just water versus your overall fluid intake, I think people make that mistake. You might drink a gallon of water, but you have like, you know, five cups of coffee as well. That's still a fluid intake. So we have to maybe account for something like that when we're looking to peak week. But I say all of that to say, I try to make sure I don't limit water, but I have them drink what's comfortable. And then looking at how much sodium they take in, um, you had mentioned, you know, a lot of people taking nine, 10,000 grams of sodium. Um, and we'll get to amounts later on, but I like to see where their sodium is at. Sometimes it might even be too low. I'm like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Actually, you're not getting that much sodium more than I thought. And usually that's a long conversation. If I really need to see what you're being like, what you're eating, because at least in America, it's pretty easy to get your salt intake in or your sodium intake in. So if somebody that I've seen is low, I kind of question what else are you using? And we may actually have to increase your sodium a little bit. And then when we do that, we may have to bump your water a little bit. And, you know, like you said, like it was just very, very nice to put. So all of that to say, like, I do a lot of information gathering, you know, seven to 10 days before the show, more so than just what I'm getting from check-ins to see what people are eating, how they're responding, what they look like, the timing, like you mentioned, because the timing is also really important. Um, we know we've got to be on the stage at a certain amount of time. So we also need to make sure that we're loading and doing things properly to try to get to that best physique possible. Uh, so I think the next steps are, you know, we know sodium glucose and water are important. You know, now how do we approach that? Now we've been dieting for so long, we're lean, so on. Like, how do we properly load these things? How do we properly put them into our plan so we can bring that fullness and leanness? Um, you had mentioned, you know, it, you know, watching your hydration, watching your urine, you know, how frequently you're urine and what you're excreting, that can also give you some signs as to what's going on with your body and where you're at. And might be some information that you need to say, Hey, we have a plan, but based off how, how frequent you're urinating and how you're doing and what your urine even looks like, we may need to make an adjustment here. Um, so also making sure that athletes are ready for that. So I guess I'm going to throw it back to you, Joe, because I have a question for you is it's peak week with your client. The thing that we've been talking about is hydration. We've been talking about sodium, glucose, water. How do you have that conversation of okay, how, how, how much do I need? Let's, let's just get into it. Let's get into the numbers a little bit. How do I know I need this to bring my best? And is it a sets thing? Are we staying here? Are we going to change this? And how are we going to change this? Well, it's like you said, it starts with information gathering because, you know, I mean, sometimes in just the the fray of, of dieting and getting lean enough, you, you're not necessarily talking about all these things. I, I don't, I don't think I audit things like sodium intake for clients often. Uh, we may get a baseline for that, but as people start increasing condiments or something, as they get a little hungrier and their calories are lower, things change. And, and sometimes I'm surprised at how little or how much sodium is in somebody's body. So we first have to go back and look at what those, those serum concentration levels might be in their body and what kind of pressure their body is under to survive currently. Uh, because, you know, sodium can even have an impact on metabolism through things like vasopressin, um, oxytocin, things like that. This, you know, from your pituitary gland, posterior pituitary to your hypothalamus, to your kidneys, adrenal glands and so forth, there is this, this neural, you know, renal loop. 
and your body is kind of dealing with whatever you're giving it. And so just, just as another pass at, you know, how homeostasis driven your body is, uh, in many, many studies from near zero to 10 to 12 grams of sodium, when people are at next to nothing or at a super physiological, ridiculous high level, serum sodium levels just don't change because your body is, is, is um, adapting to it with that water excretion or retention. I'll give an example. Uh, a friend of mine actually just had removed a, a pituitary gland tumor, a benign tumor that was putting pressure on the pituitary gland. Uh, and this is actually kind of like one in a million people have this. And what was happening was his body was getting the message from the pituitary gland because of the pressure of this tumor to retain intracellular water. Mm -hmm. And we know glycogen, like you said, already holds three to four times its weight in water. So when he had this surgery, they go through the nose, they take the tumor out. Uh, within the next two days, without any change in his eating, drinking, et cetera, he lost, I think, something like seven or eight pounds of water just in the next day as those cells were releasing the water. So that was his body fighting to survive. And so when we're looking at that final peak week lead up to a contest, uh, you're probably having unlimited water. You know, you're certainly drinking what you want more than your body needs. That's part of the process just, you know, as we're, we're dieting. Uh, I would hope you and your coach have already baselined out sodium. So you know what you're getting, what's in food and what's added to food. But remember those passive and active transport mechanisms of what is happening in the cell. We are trying to get all water that we can going into the cell. So we have to create an active transport need. And this is where people do the wrong thing by eliminating sodium. And if you start reducing sodium, you will start urinating more water out so your body can control that solute to solvents type type ratio. And, and you're just going to be flat. You're going to be flat. You're going to be cramping on stage. You're not going to be able to pump. You're not going to see vascularity, tightness, that sort of thing. And so that's where you have to say, okay, what is the right level? Because I do view water as, you know, let's just keep that as kind of a smorgasbord. Give your body what it wants. It will excrete what we don't need. And then if you are, because this does happen. I mean, you, I, if there is one or two of the most common mistakes I see with clients, we get to contest day and whether we're talking about the, their urination rate and color frequency, all that or not, they're getting flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter. Any other day that we don't see that, I have to ask myself, why are we seeing it today? And more than likely, they're not having the same level of sodium. They're not adding the condiments. They, they may have kind of prepped their food for the contest and traveled, and it's just not quite the same. So uh, we, we have to account for that, or we're gonna miss the opportunity to be full. And I've got so many pictures of clients where I see, you know, here they are when they wake up, here they are two hours later, here they are two meals later, here they are midday, end of the day. And sometimes it looks like a completely different body as they fill up, as that water hydration moves into the muscle cells. And yet they've done it all right. So they've stayed very, very, very tight. Um, so I I'll get into what I do because, you know, I may have clients having five, six, seven grams of sodium per day. Some of them are only two or three, just depending on what their normal levels are. But as I'm working on peak week with a client, water's pretty stationary. And instead of tapering down sodium, I'm probably tapering up a little bit, not a ton, but perhaps starting Friday night and then into Saturday because aldosterone levels typically run on 16 to 24 hour cycles. So you really only have that 24 hour window to make some changes. But if you're doing it right and you're not overloading with sodium, and, and I know we haven't even talked about potassium, we will get to that. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're not overloading it, that then meal to meal, you can have that effect. Like, like one of my clients who just won two pro cards and two pro titles in this last month, um, very high metabolism, super, super crazy lean. And, and he would use one to two grams of sodium with each meal. And if he wasn't doing that, he wouldn't get as full. So you would see it. And that's a lot of sodium. I mean, not everybody could use that much sodium. 
but as a super ectomorph, you know, he's drinking enough water. It's just like, boom, he would, he would just blow up in a good way, like a basketball. And so you could see that we're, we're forcing that active transport, the, the increased level of sodium is causing the, the membrane gradient to actively transport the sodium into the cell so glucose and water can follow. And that's part of maintaining that cellular health. That's all it is. You're, you're just working with your body's natural cycle to remain, remain healthy and, and as your body seeks that homeostatic balance. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm i going to bounce a little bit, but I'll, I'll make it relevant. So very similar, I think... I don't think I've had anybody under the RDA. We'll put it that way. I don't think I've ever had anybody under 2,300 milligrams of sodium. So just to throw a number out there for people. Um, I've had some people probably around that three to 3,500 milligrams of sodium and, and do well. Some have went up to similar to you, six, seven um, uh, thousand milligrams of sodium. So those, those are numbers. And we've talked about over and over again, how it's so important to, to get the sodium into the body enough so it can match the glucose and the water. Um, I want to briefly just talk about the opposite because we talked about that earlier. You know, when people start pulling sodium and pulling water to your point with like the kidney function, that's when we run into certain issues. Aldosterone is going to try to reabsorb certain things. Vasopressin is going to start to reabsorb certain things. And that's, we're going to run into some issues a little bit, you know, and I think people forget that. It's like, if we're not eating we're consuming these things. Now we're making our kidneys work so we can reabsorb some of these things so we can get our levels to stay within range. And then we talk about people doing the diuretic thing. I just wanted to touch on that. That's kind of where I'm going with this. So, you know, we're, we're either not consuming much sodium and potassium and water, and we're using diuretics to dry ourselves out. And I understand the logic to your point earlier and people trying to look leaner and harder, um, but that's now putting us at a shift with our electrolytes. That's now causing a problem, especially from what a lot of people I've heard say that they've had been on diuretics. It's usually something that's um, not potassium sparing, which is a problem. So now they run into issues like hypokalemia, which is going to possibly put them at risk for cardiac arrhythmia and things like that. Um, so you're forcing all of these things out of your body. Your kidneys aren't getting enough to get in. So it's also trying to reabsorb things that it needs, you know, sodium, water, things like that. And so we're just running into a problem come show day because we're chasing to look leaner. When in fact, if we just came in leaner, we wouldn't need to take these crazy measures. And all that we're doing is fighting ourselves. So like I said, I wasn't getting off track a little bit, but I just wanted to touch on that because I want to bring it back around to both you and I have said, you know, we want to stay pretty stable with water, stable with sodium, glucose. We know we may linear load, might load a little bit more sodium, a little more water to try to make sure that we're not just focusing on one certain thing. We're focusing on all these things that we know physiologically can help improve our look on the stage. Um, and one of those things, again, can be potassium. You know, you said we'll get to potassium. I think this is kind of a perfect segue to get into potassium. Uh, potassium is a main ion of our intracellular fluid. We've kind of mentioned that already. So we need that within our cells. You know, potassium helps with smooth cardiac skeletal muscle contraction. What are we trying to do when we're getting a pump? Contract muscles. What are we trying to do on stage? Contract muscles. So why would we eat less potassium-based foods? Why would we try to take a diuretic that's making us pee out potassium? You know, why would we put ourselves in that spot? Um, so we need to make sure that we're still eating some balanced foods, as hypocritical as that sounds. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I'm just going to eat these two things and I get it for convenience, but we need to make sure that those two, three things that you're going to eat are still going to have sodium, potassium, water, and glucose. Those are some of the big things that we really need to make sure that that is in. Because if we pull that back, as we have said, you're going to run into some problems. So Joe, uh, I'm going to throw it back to you. Let's talk more about potassium. Have you had that conversation with any of your clients about potassium? And if not, let's just use this opportunity to let people know more about potassium. Yeah, perfect. So um, here, here's the, another big mistake that the classic traditional bodybuilders use in their thought process of by the end of peak week, I'm going to have eliminated sodium and then I'm going to start increasing potassium. They think these are two opposite things. 
And to your point, you're going to start pulling in intracellular water. Uh, on a systemic level, potassium does the same thing to aldosterone as sodium. You're just if if you if you have high levels of potassium, your kidneys are going to stop excreting water. So you're going to hold water, which ironically is hopefully not a bad thing because as people dehydrate themselves to near death, and that is why some people do have cardiac arrest, you know, and and die, you know, young healthy people because they've used diuretics and they've stripped sodium out of their body and there's high levels of potassium and now super low blood pressure because of the dehydration. And so their heart just stops pumping. I mean, you, you, you don't even have the, the, um, the, I don't say voltage, but the, uh, the nerve conductivity to even contract the, the left ventricle, the heart. Um, so I, I guess it's a little bit of a saving grace that because they're overloading potassium, they are going to systemically withhold some water in their body but the irony is now you don't have the sodium to actively transport water and glucose into the cell. And so you actually look waterier. You're dehydrated, but now you're forcing all the water outside of the cells. I have a great uh, visual of this. Uh, a friend of mine I competed against, and then he became my client. You know, he was literally in tears in his hotel room saying, I looked amazing two days ago and now look at me. And he was incredibly flat and so spilled over. He, he looked like he was 15% body fat just because of water over, I mean, just spilling over. So he had overcarbed. Uh, we both competed again uh, a few weeks later. And when you see these pictures, he's the exact same weight. He was just shredded. I mean, as hard as a brick wall. The only difference was, you know, he was dehydrated and had done the whole sodium depletion, potassium load versus when I helped him stay hydrated, keep sodium and potassium in check and worked with those homeostatic pressures. So, uh, you know, the thing about potassium is it, it, there's not a huge consensus on how much we need. Uh, in today's modern Western culture, a lot of people will say, well, you need about 1.5 times the potassium to sodium. So if you're having... 2,000 milligrams of sodium, try and get about 3,000 milligrams of potassium. Uh, they say our ancestors, because of just paleolithic hunting and gathering, would almost have 11 times the amount of potassium as sodium, because there just weren't that many sodium, you know, opportunities, and they were eating a lot of, you know, roughage, a lot of fruits and vegetables. Uh, so, you know, again, homeostasis, you can survive on a lot of variation there. But when it comes to checking potassium for competitors through peak week, I rely on the fact that most people have a certain baseline level that may be, quote, enough or not enough. But when you look at a half a cup of potato or sweet potato that has maybe 500 milligrams or so of, of potassium, a banana may have about four to 500 milligrams of potassium. You know, a, a cup of, of spinach may have a thousand milligrams of sodium, or I'm sorry, potassium. You know, you can, you can look these things up. Avocado has a lot, you know, peas, other, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, raisins, you know, one of those tiny little small, whatever, you know, brand they are of, of red box raisins, you know, they have about 300 or so milligrams of potassium. I know a lot of people don't eat all of these foods on a daily basis, but for clients who are very interested, I will say, well, you know, between a multivitamin and maybe a multimineral that has a full spectrum, magnesium, calcium, potassium, et cetera, like let's just keep it very, very stable. Because if we have all of those things that are just normal components of your food intake, then we can still use sodium as a counter to whatever your whatever else minerals you're having. And, and that just becomes easier. Uh, I, I guess in a perfect world, if I told clients, let's let's audit your sodium. Let's say you're having 4,000 milligrams a day. Let's try and make sure you're getting six or so thousand milligrams of potassium. Then maybe the those gradient pressures are pretty even and we don't have a lot to worry about. You know, maybe a small increase in sodium will, will do exactly what we need. But I, I do look at their food intake as, as we're preparing for peak week. I'm looking at the foods they're consuming and I am looking at those carb sources, like how much fruit, how much vegetable. And in my mind, I'm certainly getting an idea of if they're having enough potassium or not. And if we need to worry about it. Yeah, I, I, very similar. I, I, I haven't had people say that I, I haven't had them say we're going to just track and you're going to eat 3000 milligrams of potassium. But I make sure that they're eating foods that do contain potassium for that reason. Um, 
especially if they're having just, again, they're having a hard time. Like there's other reasons for this, but I'm bringing it up anyway. You know, if they're having a hard time getting a pump, they're having a hard time getting contractions. We know we need sodium. We know we need water, but we also know we need some potassium too. So to say all of that, I just try to make sure that they're getting their base met again, whether it's a, if they got a multivitamin, but they're still eating potassium type of foods throughout the week. Cause I understand people want to use all of the quick sugars to get a quick pump and that has its place. Um, but that's not something we should be eating all of the, all of peak week either. You know, we got to make sure we still are eating good based, um, you know, fruitful veggies, all that type of stuff throughout the week. Um, so I haven't, but I just wanted to make sure that potassium got some love because it is something that is, uh, so, uh, forgotten about or rarely talked about in, in most cases of nutrition, but especially in bodybuilding. And I would love to, to kind of see some, some things in some of these bodybuilders that have died over the last couple of years. Cause I have a feeling it might be related to some hypokalemia, some low potassium levels, because that can cause cardiac arrest that can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Um, and obviously there's other factors at play, but that is something that, that has happened. I mean, I last think, year alone, I think there was about 10 bodybuilders that have died um, just either before the stage or on the stage. So I, I think that could be the opposite and, and do more to the blood pressure and, and the lack of nerve impulse because of, of no sodium. Most of the people, Austin, I, I will agree in the natural bodybuilding world. I think we have convinced people to be more concerned with hydration and proper sodium. And so potassium is just kind of forgotten. In the other side of the sport where people are still using the old school methods, they're the ones taking the 99 milligram, you know, tablets of potassium every single hour. They're getting tons of potassium and no sodium and no water. And then they're also on prescription diuretics. That is exactly how you stop somebody's heart. Mm -hmm. uh, a lethal injection designed to stop someone's heart is potassium chloride. So it's, it's a matter of leaching, you know, too much potassium inhibits the sodium's ability to actively transport into the cell. Mm -hmm. And when sodium cannot enter the cell, then the cell can't function and a muscle cell functions by contracting. So it's the fact that they have too much potassium that, that eliminates the, the transport opportunity for sodium. And, and that's what stops that. Uh, I'll give you another great example. One of my, one of my friends who became kind of an off and on client was a, a WMBF world champion. And he was still using the kind of old school methods of, of reducing water, not, not really eliminating, but reducing. And he would drop his sodium down and, and he would, he would use potassium tablets, just like we're describing. He called me from New York at, at the world championships one year, and he was literally in a contracted ball of, of total body cramping. He literally had to have his girlfriend hold the phone up to his ear. Cause if he even tried to lift his phone to his ear, his bicep would, would cramp to the point. It would almost rip off the bone. And I said, dude, you know, get some water and, and we need to get some sodium in you. Like get, do you have any packets of sodium salt, anything? And as soon as he has some water and some sodium, his body just completely relaxed. This is already an extreme sport. We're training hard. We're getting to extremely low levels of body fat. We're pushing our bodies to things it kind of doesn't really want to do, right? We don't, our body isn't like, oh, we want to lose weight today, but we still push it to lose more weight and get low levels of body fat. Now we're going to go pose on stage. So it's like, it's already an extreme sport and we're making it more extreme on ourselves by trying to do some of these crazy gimmicky tricks, which is causing us to have health problems. If you want to do this for a long time and you want to be good, learn some of these basic physiological things that we've been talking about so you can do this a long time and not wind up on a hospital bed because then you might come and see me because I do clinical nutrition all the time. And then we're going to have an embarrassing conversation about your blood levels and about your intakes. So you definitely don't want that. So anyways, that's kind of what I just wanted to laugh. I mean, you just too much potassium problem, too little potassium problem. So um, I'm, I'm going to throw it back to you because I think we've brought a lot of info, but I still feel like we have a little bit more to elaborate on. So we've already went through, you know, just the physiology and the science behind sodium, potassium, uh, water, glucose. We've went through mistakes people have made, things that can improve the physique. We've kind of dabbled into some numbers, you know, let's go through how the listener can take all of this information. How can we set everybody up listening for success? 
Well, first, don't make the mistake of thinking you know everything now, because you and I have probably touched on 5% of what we could, and we may not even know the other 95% very well. This is just what's applicable and controllable to what our goals are as physique sport uh, athletes, both in the gym and on the stage. But what I like to think of is, uh, you know, because when you think of hydration and sodium and so forth, a lot of times you're talking about blood pressure, clinical blood pressure issues and that sort of thing. In a, in a strange way, you are trying to induce pressure in your body with what we're describing. You want the cells, especially the muscle cells, fully hydrated. And when you get that, quote, mind-blowing pump where your body feels super full and tight, that's pressure. That is that is increasing blood pressure. You do that by having the water necessary to get into the cell and then you have the sodium, which allows the hydration and the glucose to get into the cell. Because you mentioned a few minutes ago about, you know, people using sugar and that kind of thing for pumps and all that. That sugar doesn't necessarily get into the muscle cell unless you have sodium as a co-transporter. So what I like to do with my clients, again, if whether we're doing some kind of a progressive linear load, or maybe it's a little bit more linear for a slow metabolic person, or maybe we end up kind of tiptoeing into a, a rapid back load because they just have an out of control metabolism. One of the things I'm doing is as we're managing those carbs is we, we have that virtually unlimited amount of water. I'm using sodium as the guide for the whole process. I know exactly how they look every day of the week. I'm monitoring their weight, their visuals, their photos two or three times a day. So I know with calorie intake, which includes the you know more static levels of protein and fat, the whatever we're doing manipulation wise, some kind of a linear or increasing carbohydrate intake to make sure that the glycogen we need that takes 24 to 48 hours to assimilate in the muscle tissue is there ahead of time. We can't rely on just contest day. So when we come down to the last 24 hours, 36 hours or so, it's now how do I manipulate sodium to make sure when I need to be my fullest and tightest, I'm there. And you know, one thing outside of condiments, if you're using pure table salt, about a half a teaspoon of table salt, which is a pretty high amount, is about 1,200 milligrams of actual sodium. So I, I, I tend to use increments like a, an eighth of a teaspoon or a fourth of a teaspoon with my clients when I say, make sure we have this much sodium on these meals. And in meal one of the day on contest day, I want enough sodium so I can see their body kind of bounce to life. You okay? You just had your first meal. You, you had plenty of water. Boom. We should see you get pretty full. If we don't see that increasing fullness meal to meal, I'm adding sodium to those next meals, which of course takes a lot of communication. Uh, and then when we get to that, that point, like I said, with my clients who are a lot more in tune with how their bodies react to sodium, uh, this client of mine who I said we had won, you know, four, four contests in a row, four, you know, titles, you know, in, in the same month. And, and we finally did reach a point of spillover, which is interesting. He abs he totally ran out of food. I mean, he was doing a two day contest. He was on stage for multiple classes over the course of two days. He had to travel. By the time we got to his last class, he was out of food and had to rely on all pretzels for his carb intake. Uh, it's all he had. And, and he started to spill over. We finally reached a level where the, the amount of extracellular sodium was starting to draw fluid back out. And so I didn't think I would ever see it. He was kind of surprised that we reached that level. And, and you can see it in the photos. It's like, there's just a little filmy blurriness. Um, whereas had he been able to just say, okay, this was enough. You know, I didn't cross that line, but that's the important lesson here is you have to know what levels your body needs. Cause we're all very, very different in our, our height and our weight and the amount of lean body mass we have our metabolic needs, the, the setup we have for what our body is used to, because uh, your body's aldosterone levels and vasopressin, things like that are all already in sync with a certain flow. So again, most of the things I'm trying to stay consistent, Austin, I, I want as few variables in, you know, moving around as possible. I want a lot of consistency. So then the ones I'm using as the tools, they are the master tools that guide the rest. 
I, I liked your wordplay there of vasopressin and aldosterone and flow. Sorry, I just had to throw that out there for the the kidney the kidney thing. Um, you cried. Yes, of course. No, uh, I love that you brought up the point of of uh, increasing blood pressure. You know, when we say that out loud, a lot of people I think associate with that as a negative thing. We don't want to have high blood pressure, right? What we're talking about is we need to increase the blood pressure to get that pump. That is something that I see time and time. And again, somebody might look great, but they're like, I just don't get a pump backstage. Could be some of these variables that we were talking about. Some people, they don't want to drink a lot of fluid on show day because they're scared, scared they're going to have to go to the bathroom on stage. And I understand that, but we're not getting enough water in. We're not getting enough sodium or if we're getting sodium and not enough water to help follow with that sodium, then we might not be getting that glucose. We might not be maximizing our blood pressure to get to that pump. So you know, we have to really, really look at what you've been doing, what your body can tolerate to your point, not change a lot of those variables too much, um, but enough to what we know can get you to that best look ever on the stage and in a healthy point. So you don't wind up in the hospital. So I, I, I love that. I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, I'm, I'm glad we did this topic today because I think we covered a lot of things that people talk about but have a hard time of finding reputable resources to go and look into. So, yeah. And, and I'm sure we'll revisit this at, at different times. For example, when we do an entire session just on carbohydrates and so forth, like this will come back up, but I definitely want to have one that was just focused primarily on hydration and therefore getting into the cellular dynamics of, of fluid movement. So, all right, awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, amazing information. And you guys who are watching, listening, stay tuned. Uh, we won't be coming out with these too quickly because they're big topics uh, and it takes a little bit of time to prepare and produce, but we'll see you next time in Contest Prep University, Peak Intel. Mm -hmm.